And so the first thing I want to do is welcome you and encourage you to reach out to us if you too are interested in these sorts of things. Uh, particularly if you're a Hope College student and want to understand more about our programming and ways that you can get involved, please do email us at marketsandmorality at hope.edu. It's um, no spaces, no dots, just marketsandmorality at hope.edu. But another distinct pleasure and point of optimism that we have tonight is based on the ability to gather folks together for this important discussion to hear from the very accomplished economist, Dr. Angela Dills, and we'll be introducing her in a moment. Um, but first, let me thank all of you for, again for being here, uh, as well as our co-sponsor, the Department of Political Science, who's responsible for some of you attending tonight. Uh, we have a great crowd of Hope College students and, of course, our very loyal Holland community members. But also because of this web format, we're able to uh, include friends from Aquinas College and Samford University as well. And uh, we've got supporters of our Markets and Morality program from around the country that are gathered with us tonight. So this is all very exciting. So just one housekeeping matter. We appreciate Dr. Dill's willingness to entertain your questions during a time of Q&A uh, with which we'll close uh, our evening tonight. And so I wanna direct your attention to the submit question button to the lower left-hand corner of your screen. This is where you can submit your questions throughout the evening. It's open even now, uh, and we hope you will do that. Let us know uh, if you don't want us to use your name, but we would love to share your name and affiliation just to um, reduce the social distance, right? We have to be physically distanced, but we don't need to be socially distanced in all these ways. So we'd love to have a conversation with you afterwards. This is also the mechanism by which students can submit their answers to the question we emailed earlier today so that you can be included in the drawing for the books that Dr. Dills has recommended for us. So now I'd like to hand things over for the evening to our MC. She is a three-year Markets and Morality member, as well as a senior economics and political science double major. Uh, Anna Kate Peterson is going to introduce our speaker. Thank you, Anna Kate. Tonight, it is my privilege to welcome Dr. Angela Dills from Western Carolina University. Dr. Dills is currently the Gimmelstad Landry Distinguished Professor, Professor of Regional Economic Development in the College of Business. She received her Bachelor of Economics in Spanish from the University of Virginia and earned her Master's in Political Economy and PhD in Economics from Boston University. Dr. Dills is on the editorial board of the Eastern Economic Journal and Economics of Education Review, as well as serving as a trustee of the Southern Economic Association. She is an expert in public economics and labor economics and has special interests in the economics of crime and economics of education and health economics. Her recent work include empirical studies on school choice, educational attainment, and the intersection of ride sharing and crime. For all of these reasons, we are grateful to have Dr. Dills here tonight uh, virtually to speak on the costs and benefits of drug prohibition. This is especially timely given the changing laws here in Michigan and throughout the United States regarding drug legalization. I know she has a thought-provoking lecture in store for us, so I will hand it over to Dr. Dills. But one of the first papers I wrote was on federal alcohol prohibition so back in the 1920s, which was an experiment in thinking about prohibition. And we wrote the paper with an eye towards applying what we learned from federal alcohol prohibition to, today, to today's war on drugs. At the time, relaxed drug laws seemed politically very far away. Today, US states and governments around the globe consistently move in the direction of softer and not harder drug laws. So I have a few goals for this evening. I'm gonna walk through a very brief history of the war on drugs. I'm gonna talk about some legislation, some um, recent history in the US in particular, affecting the sale and possession of certain substances. And then I'm gonna talk about the effects of these laws on a variety of outcomes on uh, substance use, on education, health, crime rates, traffic accidents, uh, and the like. But let's start here. So what's a prohibition? <laughs> start at the very beginning. Prohibitions make the production or the consumption or both of a good or a service illegal. In the US, a variety of goods and services are prohibited. Boat selling, illicit drugs, off prescription use of legal drugs, and prostitution, for example. Um, I'm gonna focus 
on drug and alcohol policies, but the same arguments and evidence can be marshaled for other prohibited goods and services. The next slide, please. Whoops, you already went to the, uh, go back a slide then. <laughs> there you go, very quick history, very brief history of drug prohibition. I'm only gonna focus on four dates and we'll get into a little more detail in a bit. Uh, in 1880, 1919, 1914, 1937 and 1971. So in 1880, the US prohibited the shipment of opium between the US and China. In 1914, the US banned the domestic distribution of opiates with the Harrison Narcotic Act. In 1937, Congress passed the Marijuana Tax Act, which effectively taxed and regulated marijuana in such a way that it effectively criminalized the use, possession, sale, or prescription of marijuana. And in 1971, the Nixon administration began the war on drugs with the Drug Enforcement Agency founded in 1973. At each of these moments, prohibitions against drugs have been motivated in no small part by racial animus against the waves of Chinese immigrants post-Civil War, against the uptick of Mexican immigrants in the 1910s and 1920s, and then against African-Americans with Nixon's war on drugs. Next slide, please. A lot of what we know about drug laws and about prohibition stem from changes in laws around marijuana particularly in the US with various states adopting a variety of laws, but also global changes in drug laws. But let me first describe some of the changes in the US. So to clarify, at the federal level, the production and consumption of marijuana is illegal. It's a schedule one substance, which indicates that it's a drug with no known medical use. However, in December, 2020, so just two months ago, the US House of Representatives voted to decriminalize cannabis at the federal level through the Marijuana Opportunity Reinvestment and Expungement Act, the MORE Act. Uh, it's just limited to marijuana and it hasn't yet been passed by the Senate. The according to federal law, marijuana is still illegal to consume or produce. At the state level, states have adopted marijuana laws in three forms, typically in this order, decriminalization, then medicalization, and then recreational marijuana laws. Decriminalization reduces the penalty for being caught with small amounts of marijuana, typically only enough for personal consumption. And the penalty is typically reduced to something like a traffic violation, a couple of hundred dollars fine or a slap on the wrist. Many states initially decriminalized in the 1970s in response to the beginning of the federal war on drugs. Many others have decriminalized in the past 10 years or so. Medicalization is typically the next step that states take towards softening their marijuana laws. California was the first state to adopt a medical marijuana law, I believe in 1996. These laws allow patients to purchase, or in some states grow, marijuana and consume marijuana to treat a medical condition. Currently 36 states in the District of Columbia, this, this map here gives you a sense of what those states are, have adopted medical marijuana laws. These laws, however, differ pretty substantially across states. In some places, the list of covered medical conditions for which you can um, obtain medical marijuana is pretty short. In others, that list of conditions is really long and pretty inclusive, and it includes conditions such as chronic pain that can be difficult to medically verify. For some states, that medical marijuana law approaches a legal regime. Two new states voted for medical marijuana in the 2020 election, Mississippi and South Dakota. In 15 states and the District of Columbia, um, those states have fully legalized possession of small amounts of marijuana for adults recreational list. This includes in the 2020 ballots, voters voting for recreational marijuana in Arizona, in Montana, in New Jersey, and in South Dakota. Michigan, legalized recreational marijuana for adults 21 and over in the 2019. So also one of those 15 states in the District of Columbia. Except for Oregon's vote in 2020 to decriminalize the possession of all illicit substances, states treat cocaine, heroin, meth, and all other illicit substances as illegal to possess, consume, or produce. And of course, federal law trumps state law, and federal law still treats marijuana as a Schedule I substance. 
Next slide, please. So the enforced drug laws, including arresting offenders, adjudicating their cases, incarcerating convicted offenders, as well as intercepting drug traffickers, it's expensive. So one estimate of what the US spends annually on the war on drugs is about 47 billion with a B dollars. So let's think what we get with our $47 billion. So what does drug prohibition do? Next slide, please. And one more, maybe. <laughs> there you go. Great. Um, so first, we'll start with its stated intention. The intention of prohibition is to reduce the consumption of the prohibited substance. But the first thing we have to note is that prohibition doesn't eliminate consumption. What it does is drive the consumption underground into illegal markets. Next slide, please. Current estimates of illicit drug consumptions are that rough, of consumption is that roughly 5% of the world consumes illegal drugs. These are a little bit dated estimates as with one of the challenges with doing any kind of research on a prohibited substance is of course the data is a little bit more challenging to obtain than research on legal substances. Um, there are some estimates in the past 15, 20 years of the magnitude of the drug market. The UNODC, which is the United Nations Office of Drug Control, estimate, estimated the size of the drug market at about $320 billion in 2003, which is just under 1% of global GDP at the time. Uh, for the US, the market size is roughly similar. It's just under 1% of GDP. The most recent estimate is from RAND in 2010, and they estimate uh, their middle estimate of the US market was 25 to $40 billion of marijuana sales, 28 billion in cocaine sales, 27 billion in heroin sales, and about 13 billion in methamphetamine sales, which again, all together, that makes up 0.7% of US GDP in 2010. So certainly consumption hasn't been eliminated. eliminated. Um, in terms of who's using drugs in the US, roughly 11% of the population age 12 and older used an illegal substance in the past month or report to surveyors that they've used an illegal substance in the past month. About half have done so in their lifetime. So clearly prohibiting drug use hasn't eliminated drug use, but um, has prohibition reduced drug use? So next slide, please. We expect it to, right? So we expect prohibitions, especially ones that are enforced to reduce demand. So consumers face the risk of arrest and incarceration that raises the full price of consuming a substance, likely reducing their quantity demanded, demand curves slope downwards. Um, whether the law changes people's tastes and preferences is unclear. For some, the illegal nature of the substance may suggest that it's wrong to consume those substances and reduce their demand. For others, forbidding a substance may lead to the forbidden fruit effect, encouraging some to consume substances they may not have been interested in prior to the law. So what do we empirically observe? The research implies that prohibitions likely reduce consumption modestly. Um, and research to answer this question considers a variety of legal changes. My own research with my mentor, Jeff Myron, suggests that federal alcohol prohibition in the 1920s reduced alcohol consumption by 10 to 20%. We also have, um, other, from other researchers, we have international evidence from Portugal, from the Netherlands, from parts of Australia, um, and parts of London, all of which suggest little, a little, a small increase or no increase of looser or no increase from looser marijuana laws on drug use. Um, this perhaps is less surprising um, if you think about the fact that the demand for illicit substances tend to be, for all you economic students out there, it tends to be highly inelastic. Um, we see the effects of, for example, when the DEA has a huge drug bust in the methamphetamine market, temporarily prices increased, but that only led to a very small decrease in consumption. Um, state laws that targeted over-the-counter medicines that used to produce methamphetamine, so like when you go to buy Sudafed and they make you sign your name, those laws reduced domestic meth labs, 
but they didn't change consumption or arrests for drug possession. So we can see that even with really strict enforcement of drug laws or, or moving in the other direction, relaxation of drug laws, we can see that we observe small changes in drug consumption, but not large changes. Um, at best, drug prohibition modestly reduces consumption, probably on the order of at most 10 to 20%. Next slide. As good economists though, we need to ask if there are other effects of these laws. We need to think beyond stage one as Thomas Sowell would urge us. So I'm gonna walk through some of the changes we expect to see for producers and for consumers. I'm gonna start with producers. Next slide, please. So first for producers, prohibitions might increase costs. So operating in a legal market, adds costs that legal producers don't face. So drug entrepreneurs invest millions in electric submarines, which is what this is a picture of, and low profile vessels to transport cocaine into the US. Traffickers dig tunnels equipped with rails and trolleys to transport drugs and untaxed cigarettes across borders. Jet skis, boats, and now drones deliver packages of illicit drugs across political borders. Um, all of these are costs in transportation and dissemination that legal producers typically don't incur. Of course, illicit producers avoid some costs that legal producers incur. Taxes and environmental and labor laws, for example. Work by Jeff Myron suggests that legal production may only be somewhat cheaper than illegal production, but we expect to see uh, some increase in costs, some increase in costs due to the prohibition. Next slide, please. Illicit producers have historically been more concentrated in that they experience more market power or act more like monopolists. So the, these extensive transportation networks that are needed to deliver goods without detection or to bribe officers of the law, all of these costs imply that it can be cheaper for one producer to supply the market than for many producers to supply the market. Powerful drug cartels are an example of this. And what can firms with market power do? They can raise prices above marginal cost and earn long run profits. Um, so prohibitions are driving prices higher and uh, allowing those profits to go towards drug cartels and other people who are willing and able to operate in the legal market. Next slide, please. Although I should also point with our little dude with the, <laughs> the, the drugs that the flip side of this is not only are illegal tra drug traffickers earning large profits by having market power, but by acting in untaxed markets, by selling in illicit markets, uh, governments are foregoing opportunities to raise tax revenue. And uh, I looked it up this morning, in 2020, Colorado, for example, brought in $387 million in tax revenues just on the taxes and fees for marijuana. What else does the war on drugs do? War on drugs and prohibitions in general increase violence. So when Walgreens and CVS compete, they compete on the price and quality of their goods and services. If they behave fraudulently, they could be sued or complaints can be made to the Better Business Bureau. When illicit drug producers compete, they can't use the legal system. They can't use sort of traditional means of advertising. Jeff Myron considers the evidence on homicides and expenditures on prohibition enforcement in the US, um, as well as across a sample of countries. And he attributes 25 to 75% of the homicide rate being um, due to drug prohibition. Investing in violent means of securing and maintaining their illicit trade routes can be really profitable for drug cartels, but it leads to significant harms around the world. Drug cartels in Mexico, for example, have led to the deaths of 85,000 people. Uh, looking back at federal alcohol prohibition, Emily Owens uses age-specific homicide rates and documents that federal prohibition in increased violence around the markets for bootlegged alcohol. Um, other research describes market value, that violence in the U.S. and global underground tobacco markets. It's not specific to drugs, 
but we certainly see it in markets with strong prohibitions. Next slide, please. My colleague, Audrey Redford, adds another effect on the, to suppliers. Uh, she terms this malnovation. So, uh, and and what she, how she defines malnovation is a form of innovation that illegal drug entrepreneurs use to circumvent the law. So they're chemically altering um, illegal scheduled drugs just enough so that their newly created drug is not technically on the scheduling list and thus not illegal. Designer drugs, analogs, um, bath salts, all of which are inferior and more dangerous products are examples of this malnovation. Um, we see this in other ways because of transporting products uh, across political borders, trying to evade detection, entrepreneurs invest in drugs that can be produced closer to home. For example, heroin and other opioids are produced from the gum of opium poppies, which are primarily and very visibly grown in Afghanistan and Latin America. So you could fly over a field and observe a poppy field relatively easily. But the costs of either transporting the product from the Middle East with, or from Latin America without detection or grow, trying to grow it domestically in a way that's not easily observed, both of those ended up being fairly cost prohibitive. So what we've seen entrepreneurs do is instead invest in synthetic opioids, opioids generated in a lab like fentanyl. Um, and these kinds of innovations, but innovations not to benefit consumers, but instead to get around the law, um, these innovations have made the drugs that consumers consume uh, more dangerous. And in fact, we've, due to that, we've seen a large increase in unintentional drug overdoses. The rates in 1970 were about 1.2 deaths per 100,000. Uh, and we're almost 20 times that, 20.6 deaths per 100,000 in 2018. And much of that current concern comes from heroin cut with fentanyl, a drug that can be 50 to 100 times more potent than morphine. Okay, next slide, please. What about consumers? So if costs are maybe higher for producers than we can think about how those costs are passed along to consumers. Any of those effects on producer costs are passed to consumers. Although drug prices in the US are typically low relative to other countries, but the full price of drug use for consumers includes both, the, also includes the expected costs of arrest and of incarceration. Next slide, please. You can see this one moved a little bit. Okay, I like this graph though. All right, so, <laughs> That arrest or incarceration and the penalty you might face as a consumer depends on the amount of the product, the weight of the product found on the person. So this, along with the desire to avoid detection, leads producers and consumers to prefer high, high potency, easily, easier to conceal substances. So just like you might, students might not try to sneak a keg into a football game, but rather slide a uh, a flask in their boot or something e more easily concealed, we observe the same thing happening in illicit drug markets. What does that mean? Well, if we're, it, it typically means that drugs being sold are sold at higher potency, and then they can be cut down to the correct potency as long as you know what the original potency was and or what the retailer has cut it down with. Um, so one of the challenges that happens, particularly with opiates, is that these more potent drugs that are then cut down, sometimes with drug substances like fentanyl, and the consumer is, is faced with purchasing a project with product with unknown potency, um, leading, making it much more likely that the consumer overdoses. Um, <clears throat> We can also see this, which is what the graph is showing. This is from a, a website, the title, the title of the graph is not your grandmother's weed. Uh, as you can see in this graph, this is a graph about what's happening, happening to the potency of marijuana since the start of the war on drugs. So there's two components of marijuana, CBD and THC. THC is the main psychoactive, psychoactive compound in cannabis. That's the part that produces the high 
sensation. Uh, and CBD is psychoactive, but it's not in the same manner. Um, and it's been shown to help with anxiety, depression, other things. And what you can see in the graph is that over time, the CBD content of marijuana seized by the DEA has remained relatively stable. But what has changed over time is that THC content. We've seen a large increase, which is this dramatic increase in the THC content of marijuana seized by the US, uh, implying that today's marijuana is much more potent than marijuana sold decades earlier. Next slide, please. I like this meme. It's a little old, but I like it. <laughs> uh, uh, so in 2018, 1.6 million people were arrested for drug law violations, almost all of which, 1.4 million, were for drug possession. And about 40% of which, so 663,000 people were arrested for marijuana law violations. So the US, the US in general has an incarceration habit. The country has by far one of the highest incarceration rates globally. We imprison 655 people per 100,000. El Salvador is the closest country to us at about 618. Uh, Rwanda, Russia, and Brazil are the only ones even in the ballpark after that. Uh, their rates are in the three and four hundreds. But most of the uh, rest of the OEC OECD countries, most of the rest of the developed world have rates more like Australia, who imprisons 172 per 100,000 people, or Spain at 127, or say Sweden at 59 per 100,000. So we're imprisoning 10, five to 10 or more times as many people uh, per capita as many other developed countries. Now, only a small piece of this can be explained by drug law violations, but it is a piece of the story. In 2018, there were 443,000 Americans incarcerated for drug laws, almost all of whom are in state prisons and jails. So mostly these are, the, these are, the drug law violations are large fractions of the state uh, prison and jail populations, but relatively small fractions of the federal prison population. But mandatory minimum sentencing laws, for example, means that those incarcerated spend more time incarcerated than they did in previous decades, which is partly what's driving our high incarceration rates. Next slide, please. Drug laws are unevenly enforced. Um, drug use prevalence is similar by race and ethnicity, but drug laws are disproportionately enforced against minority communities. Uh, sociologist Michelle Alexander has a book called The New Jim Crow. She does an excellent job documenting this disparate impact. Uh, the enforcement of drug laws, the militarization of the police to fight that war on drugs has increased tensions between the police and these communities uh, that are disproportionately targeted by the police. Uh, for example, so past year drug use rates are pretty much exactly the same between whites and blacks, 21.7% for whites, 21.9% for blacks. Rates for Hispanics are a little bit lower, 19.1%, uh, but the rates are fairly equivalent across uh, these broad categories of race and ethnicity. But arrest rates for drug possession are substantially higher among blacks and Hispanics than among whites. Uh, a recent paper tracks all the arrests for misdemeanor and felony drug and alcohol related charges for one county. So they went and pulled all the paperwork from 2009 and 2018. And what uh, these researchers find is that whites are more likely than blacks and Hispanics to be cited and released. But blacks and Hispanics are more likely to be booked into jail, convicted and serve time than are whites. And national figures on arrests for drug law violations and prisoner characteristics similarly show disproportionately high arrest rates and imprisonment rates for drug offenses for Blacks and Hispanics. Cooper links the war on drugs and its police strategies of stop and frisk and SWAT teams to the police brutality of Black communities. And many high profile cases of police misconduct say against Victims like George Floyd or Breonna Taylor or Jacob Blake have generated thousands of protests and demonstrations in 2020 alone. Uh, next slide, please. 
outside of consumers and producers and those directly involved in the market for illicit substances, the war on drugs has other limitations. In particular, it severely limits medical research. Uh, a recent article in the journal Nature describes how difficult, if not impossible, researchers find it to be to conduct medical research on illicit substances, which has really limited available treatment for long-term pain, for nausea, for PTSD, and other conditions that um, there's strong reasons to think that some illicit substances might successfully treat. Since the 1970s, the federal agency, uh, the National Institute for Drug Abuse reports that, so the DEA has issued one single registration over the past 50 years uh, for the cultivation of marijuana for research. The University of Mississippi has been like the place to get marijuana if you wanna do research on the medical benefits or harms of marijuana. Um, this may change. Uh, in December, the Senate passed a bill allowing that number of registrations to increase, but for 50 years, the state has been, the state of regulation has been that it's almost impossible to obtain the substance needed to run the clinical trials to document effective medical um, treatments. Uh, for those of you who may be concerned about substance use disorders, prohibitions inhibit people's willingness to seek treatment. Um, recent research demonstrates that pregnant women with substance use disorders are more likely to seek, treat, seek treatment when states adopt prenatal substance use policies that include treatment and support and aren't solely criminal justice oriented. Treating addiction and substance use disorders like medical issues instead of like crimes leads to more effectively provided care. Next slide. All right, so we have all these changes in drug laws that have happened and they're mostly over the last 20 to 30 years. Uh, deep states have decriminalized, states have medicalized, states have adopted recreational marijuana laws. And then we have various countries who have also changed their drug laws. Uh, so I'm gonna very briefly summarize what we've seen resulting from all of these state level and country level changes on the war on drugs. So next slide, please. Apparently I missed one, but that's okay. So, so let me start with decriminalization. So what do we know about decriminalization? Most, the evidence on decriminalization suggests that there are mixed and fairly small estimated effects on consumption. It's not clear that many residents in states that decriminalized drugs, particularly in the 1970s, it's not clear that people were aware that that happened or what that meant. Uh, and not surprisingly, there then weren't very large effects on consumption. We have much, uh, more extensive research on the adoption of medical marijuana laws. What we see in states that adopt medical marijuana laws tends to be an increase in marijuana consumption among adults, although not among um, people, uh, among teens or those not of legal age. So uh, we, we also see a variety of other effects from medical marijuana laws. We see in some cases, decreases in crime, declines in traffic fatalities, and declines in suicides, particularly among men aged 20 to 39. Uh, declines in suicide possibly because, uh, as these researchers say, that marijuana helped them cope with stressful life events. Some of these observed effects of the softening of marijuana laws and medicalization, for example, appear to be due to decreased alcohol consumption. So people are switching from consuming alcohol to consuming marijuana, um, which, turns out is generally speaking a less harmful substance, um, but when the law treats those substances more evenly, consumers switch to safer substances. What about recreational laws? So part of the challenge, so next slide please. So if we look at the adoption of recreational marijuana laws, um, the, the, this headline here is from a paper I wrote with a couple of co-authors in 2016, looking at the early adopters of recreational marijuana laws. So, so we looked at Colorado and Oregon and Washington, and when we had data, Alaska and Nevada, uh, there's typically fairly long lags in obtaining data on some of these outcomes. So it takes a little bit of time to evaluate all the effects of laws. Um, we look at a laundry list of outcomes. We look at drug consumption, prices, suicide rates, drug treatment admissions, crime rates, traffic fatalities, school suspensions, school expulsion, standardized test scores, uh, and unemployment rates. And basically what we observe is 
if there's not a whole lot going on, perhaps in part because by the time these states adopt recreational marijuana laws, they've already decriminalized and adopted medical marijuana laws. So the difference in many states between medical and recreational is fairly slight. And perhaps not surprisingly, we then see little effect on a wide variety of outcomes. We recently updated, updated that work. It's not quite come out yet. I think we, we sent it to the editor a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we added data from California and Maine, Massachusetts, Vermont, that list, and we see pretty similar non-effects. Uh, I look forward to getting more research as more data comes along and after these laws have been adopted. But generally what we're seeing is none of the wonderful things that advocates of these laws are hoping would happen have happened. And none of the terrible things that um, people who are against these laws are feared would happen have happened. Um, in fact, we've seen very little effect other than on state tax revenues from legalizing recreational marijuana. Next slide. Maybe click one more time for me. Oh, okay. Well, now go back one. Here, we can say success, whatever. So what did we get? So the war on drugs. We modestly reduce demand, maybe 10 to 20%. We waste the lives of hundreds of thousands through convicting them and imprisoning them, raising drug prices and profits for drug cart sellers, uh, leading to more dangerous substances being produced and consumed, increasing violence and restricted medical research, all for the bargain basement price of $47 billion a year. So uh, <laughs> I think now you can go for success. <laughs> success. Yes. Sorry, I can't. I'm usually a very sarcastic person, so I'm trying to hold it in. But um, uh, I would argue that the war on drugs has not only very had little success in its intended effects, it has had a wide variety of harms as a result of it. And I'm encouraged. In fact, I have hope, Professor Estelle. Uh, <laughs> I have hope for uh, all the softening of drug laws that we've seen in the past decades and, and that we are currently seeing some movement in the future. Next slide, please. But I'm also happy for you to email me. My email is my name, angeladills at gmail.com if you have other questions or are interested in seeing um, uh, the research that I'm citing, I'm happy to send you that as well. So feel free to send me an email if you like. Great. Well, thank you so much um, for such an interesting and insightful lecture, Dr. Dills. Um, as Professor Estelle said, uh, continue to send in your questions and comments and what you would like to hear us talk about um, virtually. Um, so just to start off with a couple of questions, some students have already asked about the longer term consequences of legalizing marijuana in light of, as they put it, the possibility that marijuana is a gateway drug. Um, so student Logan asks whether state legalization of marijuana is then itself going to be a gateway, gateway but to legalizing other more serious drugs. Um, Jordan wonders what our response should be to that potential that other drugs might be legalized. So your thoughts on that. I think it's kind of two questions. So let me, let me, I'm going to pretend it's two questions. So the first part of the question is marijuana itself a gateway drug to, to using harder substances. I think the evidence on this is a little bit, one, it's very hard to untangle. So um, it, it is the case that if you are observing people as they consume a variety of substances that they tend to work their way up their ladder, right? So, um, you know, people who, people don't go from not consuming anything at all to, to using heroin. They typically take a few steps along the way of consuming alcohol, marijuana and the like. Um, so it is true that we see people walk along that path. It's a different question to ask whether causally, if I gave someone marijuana, if they would then be much more likely to go on and try other substances. And I think that actually is a less clear link um, in terms of drug consumption. And in fact, for example, one of the things I think in gen most most consumers of illicit substances would like to con consume a safe substance that provides them with a nice high. 
um, they'll settle for a less safe substance if they also get a high, but I think most people would like a safer substance. substance. And, and in fact, so part of what I'm arguing here is that prohibition is making it harder for consumers to find safe substances, and it's reducing the incentive for producers to innovate in ways to create those substances. They're innovating in ways to avoid the law. They're innovating in ways to avoid detection. They're not focusing their efforts like legal entrepreneurs do in satisfying the consumer. So that's part of it. Particularly if we think about some of the drugs we're really concerned about today, which is opioid use, um, I think the evidence here is also a little bit mixed. Um, but if we think about the path a lot of opioid users end up using, something happens, uh, they have a medical event, they're prescribed opioids for post-surgery or something, or for pain um, management. They get addicted. They're not able to obtain a sufficient quantity, and they end up um, seeking out drugs on the illicit, illegal market. If for, for many of these patients, marijuana might work well if they could obtain it legally, if they could have it paid for, for with their insurance and the like as a pain medication. And in fact, in some cases, what we see with medical marijuana laws is some switching away from opioids towards medical marijuana. Um, one group for which this is really challenging, for example, is veterans who in many cases have high needs for pain, pain management, but they can't, um, they risk losing their veterans benefits if they're caught with marijuana on them. So that's sort of the drug question. <laughs> but I think the other part of your question um, is a political question, right? Which is like, is it a gateway drug for politicians to adopt? <laughs> uh, and I, I suspect it is. Uh, I, think, I think if we look at Oregon, that's probably what's happening, right? We went from, uh, it, the states, are, states tend to follow this path. We're gonna decriminalize it. We're gonna medicalize it. We're gonna legalize recreational marijuana. And then maybe we'll go and, and, and do like Oregon or like Portugal and legalize the possession of all kinds of substances. Um, we'll treat consumers of drugs as patients if they need to be treated, if they have a medical concern about their drug use uh, instead of as criminals. Uh, so do I think that's true? Yes, I think that's true. Um, I, do I think it's a bad thing? I'm not sure I think it's, a, I don't think it's a bad thing, no. <laughs> um, I do, however, think that here is a place where federalism is amazing because people of Oregon voted for this. They agreed to this. They, they'll give it a shot. And people who live in more conservative places who are more worried about the effects of these laws, can, we can just sit back and watch Oregon. We can see what happens um, before choosing to make that decision ourselves. So I think there's a lot of benefits here in living in a place with that federalism where we can learn from other states' choices and decide whether that's right for us. Yeah, yeah that's a very interesting point with um, different states acting as experiments and seeing you know, what legally works and what works for their constituents. And then you can see how it goes in your own state. So I really like that you pointed that out. Um, so we also have a lot of questions pouring in. Um, another one uh, is from our very own Markets and Morality member, uh, Mike. He asks, uh, considering the cost of the war on drugs to the US, have there been any attempts to quantify the costs on the economy when a greater percentage of the population uses illicit drugs? And how do those costs compare to the costs incurred by the US government? Oh, so this is so you've got some well trained economists here. So that's great. So we always have to ask compared to what? And that's that's perfect, right? So I can talk about the enforcement costs, although even those are probably somewhat under um, undercounting, right? The uh, that 47 billion is counting explicit enforcement. It's not counting things like when you incarcerate someone, you ruined their ability to find a whole host of jobs uh, because they're convicted felons. You've reduced, you know, you've changed their family lives dramatically. You maybe changed how how their parent, their children have grown up uh, with an incarcerated parent and the like. Uh, so I, you know, there's a lot of things we're also not counting there. But I think it's it's a great point to note that. Are there other costs from legalizing drugs? So, if so, 
we're, we're going to save 47 billion. Right. So for the government's perspective, like the costs are like we save the enforcement costs, it's probably going to be taxed like everything else is taxed. And so you increase the tax revenue as well. So the, the net fiscal benefit is quite large for governments. Hmm. But I think the question is something more than that. Right. So we're going to we expect to see small increases, 10 to 20 percent increases in consumption of illicit substances. So what kind of harms would we expect from that? Um, I, I, so I would argue that the vast majority of harms from substance use comes from the fact that they're operating in illegal markets, not from the substances themselves. Now, is it the case that people become addicted and have substance use disorders? Yes, that, it, that happens. And it's a tragedy for them and their families. Um, and I would like it to be easier for us to, for those, those addicts who want treatment to obtain treatment. And I think that's an important thought about how we're gonna spend any cost savings or tax revenues in these states. But a lot of the other aspects, we're thinking about overdoses, for example, a lot of that is driven. I mean, it's much less likely for someone to purchase a drug at CVS and overdose on it. They know what they're buying. They know exactly what they're getting and they can make a dose uh, a, a choice of dose that's right for them. Um, they can ask people and say, like, hey, I haven't, I've been in prison and haven't, one of, so I mentioned I've been in prison because a lot of people, a lot of, one of the regular causes of overdose is people who were incarcerated and come out of incarceration and don't think about how much their tolerance have changed. And so they incorrectly dose themselves. Uh, and so I think some of those harms that we expect to see from substance use are much less likely to happen in a legal environment where treatment is more readily available, more easily asked for, asked for and where dosages and product quality is more obvious. But it's a great question. I like your economic thinking. <laughs> or that student's economic thinking. <laughs> right. Um, we have another um, kind of economic lingo question here uh, about paternalism. Um, so Cameron asks, do you think that shifts away from paternalism in marijuana laws and prohibition will influence paternalism in other, other federal policies? Hmm. So I, tell me who asked the question. Did they give their name? Uh, Cameron, Cameron Zell. Cameron. Yeah, so I think Cameron's more optimistic than I am. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I had, so I don't think I had ever thought of these changes in marijuana laws as as being um, in, in indicating some decline in paternalism. I I don't I don't know that I hear that kind of change in the rhetoric. Although I'd be happy to be wrong there. So I think a lot of the change in in drug laws has stemmed from just, well, one, sympathy for drug addicts, drug users, people suffering from drug use disorders and thinking like treating, throwing them in jail is just not working. I think, you know, if I talk to people who work in our health system, who work in our criminal justice system, you know, they, they know that this isn't the right place for these people to be. And, but, and yet that's where many of them end up. Um, so I think some of it may be just, we'd like to be paternalistic in a different way. <laughs> so, like that wasn't working, so let's try something else. Right. Um, but I like Cameron's optimism. Uh, I wish that I thought that it in indicated some uh, decline in paternalism on the part of our government. Right, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Um, we have another question from actually one of my own classmates in economic senior research, Becca, uh, who, like me, might be thinking about uh, data sources a lot these days. I, I know I am. <laughs> um, she wonders, was data difficult for you to find in your research due to the prohibition and the fact that it, this is illicit uh, uh, drugs? What type of data did you use and how did you come across it? Yeah, so... Um... So I'll, I'll address this in a couple of ways. So first, I'll, 
for, for federal alcohol prohibition, the papers we wrote about the 1920s were really fun because not only are we trying to find data on illicit substances, but we're trying to find like 100, you know, 80 year old data on <laughs> illicit substances, which is even more fun. Um, and in fact, we can't, we never did, you can't find um, uh, estimates of alcohol consumption, you can't find estimates of um, alcohol production that are sort of legitimate during that time period. So we end up using a bunch of proxies. We used deaths due to uh, cirrhosis of the liver. And then we had some measures of arrests for drunkenness from a couple of different sources uh, and looked at those. So we used a couple of different proxies with, for, the, for the research we did on the 1920s. For more recent research, almost all the research on drug. So if, if you're interested in, in prevalence of drug use, you have a few options. So you can either use survey data so there's a couple of national surveys that are that ask about drug use, um, the behavioral risk, purpose, behavioral risk factor surveillance system, um, the NSDUH, the National Survey on Drug. I don't know what the UNH stands for, NSDUH, <laughs> uh, which is, um, I missed a letter in there. Uh, they, all, they, they probably put out the most substantive uh, substance use survey data. Uh, you can also find surveys of high schoolers from Monitoring the Future, where you, they track young people's uh, substance use, including alcohol and tobacco and drug use. So there's some reasonable um, survey data that's, I mean, you, you, you might be concerned that changes in drug laws also change people's willingness to say yes on a survey. So there's a little bit of concern about changes in reporting, um, but you're going to have to, you know, we have to live with all we have. And then the other kinds of sources that people use is they look at admissions for drug treatment, um, overdoses. Those are probably the big ones. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so yeah. And, and then you're catching kind of the tail end too, right? So you're not just tracking all consumption, but tracking people who have substance use disorders or uh, you know severe problems or, or really negative interactions with the drugs that they're consuming. Right, right. Yeah. So a question um, related to markets and morality. Um, we're glad to have a question, have received a question about morality and drug and the intersection of the two. Um, so how can one understand the intersection between drug use and abuse in morality or religion? Like how can these issues be resolved without sacrificing either liberty or personal morality? Yeah, so I I talk about legalizing drugs all the time. I have zero interest or desire in consuming illicit drugs. Um, my kids know it, my, my kids are six, 10, and I should know the answer to the six, 10, and 13. And they know that, <laughs> they know I'm up here talking about illegal drugs and they, you know, and they hear me talk about how harmful they are and, and, um, and, that I expect them not to consume drugs, right? And, and all the reasons why, why, you know, particularly while they're young and their brains are developing and all the harms they can have. Is that a hard conversation to have as a parent instead of just to say, well, you know, I don't want you to go to prison. Y yeah, but like, that's the right thing for me to tell them as their parent. Um, so I think, is it moral to use drugs I don't really know the answer to that, I guess, right? Like, I think, um, I think there's a danger in being addicted to anything and still trying to behave morally, whether your addiction is to an illegal substance or a legal substance or work or any other things, right? That um, it's difficult to be moral if you're so attached to one thing that you can't think morally. So I think that's part of it. I think an important thing to consider here is also that laws don't necessarily reflect our morality. There are things that are legal and immoral. There are things that are moral and illegal. And we, we need to be careful not to automatically look at something being illegal and think that it's immoral. So it's perfectly legal for me to take my paycheck at the end of the month and go to the bar and drink it all away or spend it on new shoes or, you know, whatever floats my boat, right? Like, 
uh, is that a moral thing for me to do instead of like feeding my children? No, right? Like, I shouldn't be doing that. Um, is it moral for me to spend my weekends cooking lasagna or making sandwiches and passing them out to homeless people in a park? Sounds like a pretty moral thing to do. Is it illegal? In lots of places it is because I don't have an industrial kitchen and I have a dog walking through my kitchen. Probably I can't give that food away. Um, so I think we have to be really careful to think about our own morals, to seek guidance on our morals from people that we trust, um, have this, and to have those conversations instead of looking to government to provide us. Government has done all kinds of things in, you know, that I, I, but by the protests in the streets, we should know that many consider are not moral. Um, you know, police mis misconduct, the police is the government, right? Uh, so, it's hard for me to look and to, to approach life as thinking, yes, whatever the government does is more. Yeah, so it just takes a perspective of personal morality and public yes. morality and just kind of finding the balance between, you know, how, how far do we take our personal morality into the public sphere where we all don't share the same ideals? Well, and I actually think, so I, I like that point. Okay, so yes, I think you should have those conversations. I, I think it's great you're at a university, a college where you're having those conversations. That's wonderful. Um, you're having those conversations in your religious institutions. You're having those conversations with your family, with your elders. All of that is great. But I also think that you develop that expertise and you owe it to your friends and family and community to share that as well. Like, I, I think it's fine to take it in the public sphere and to use your influence to talk in reasonable ways about why you've come to those decisions and to help persuade your peers. I think those are that's a great use of your talents. Great. Um, we have a question from a student uh, from Aquinas College um, named Irwin, and he asks about reducing the legal age of consumption back to 18 years old, uh, like a lot of other countries have done. Um, he asked, would that have similar effects? Yeah, it's a good question. So age restrictions, um, they work in the sense that they reduce consumption. We see, you know, we see, for example, jumps in alcohol consumption when people turn 21. We see jumps in tobacco consumption when people turn 18. So clearly these age restrictions restrict some people, prevent some people from consuming those substances until they're of legal age. Um, I mean, not a whole lot, a huge, a huge number of people who are under 21 drink alcohol, uh, um, not smoking rates are going down. So tobacco use is a little bit different, but we still see something like 4% of 12 to 17 year olds are using tobacco. So, I mean, people, again, it's a, it's a, it's a prohibition for a particular group. It works in the sense that it reduces consumption somewhat. Um, but it doesn't eliminate it. Um, we still see those groups obtaining substances typically through older friends or uh, acquaintances or just tapping someone on the shoulder and asking them to purchase it for them. Um, so would I, if I, if we say lower the legal age to 18, I don't know if it's a question about alcohol or about marijuana or both or, but, um, would I expect to see increase, increases in substance use for those groups? Probably. Um, I don't know if there's if it's still active. There used to be a group called um, like the Amethyst Society or something like that. It was an organization of college presidents who were arguing for a lower drinking age, uh, mostly because they wanted young people to start drinking while they were still at home with their families and still instead of coming to college and beginning their initiating that drinking experience in, in a college environment away from their family. And I think their argument was along the lines of, well, wouldn't this be better for most people to have begun this conversation and experience under the oversight of their families? <laughs> and, and, and I think there's some truth to that. Um, I think how we treat children, how we treat young people is a challenge, I think. Uh, it's not, I, I don't have any clear and pat answers. I, my my mentor, Jeff Myron, would 
probably be fine saying, yeah, sure, let's sell crack to eight-year-olds. I'm not really in that ballpark. Like, I think there's probably a line, but I do think that we have to allow young people to become adults and let them make decisions and um, I, what the right age is for that, I'm not sure. It is certainly the case for all the young people out there that it's worse to consume most substances when you're still, your brain is still developing, which happens until you're about 25. So FYI. <laughs> Good to know. <laughs> yeah. um, so Nathan, another economics uh, Hope, uh, major from Hope College asks, what are your thoughts on state laws on drug on state laws on drugs differing specifically do you find that decriminalization in one state in, uh, impacts consumption in another state a neighboring state for instance uh, in other words do we observe spillover effects on the state level uh, yes we do so i think most most of the research that looks at this is you know sort of looking at the differential timing along the border of oregon and washington for example and there's definitely spillover effects um, we see people driving across borders to obtain substances. Um, happens a little less. It doesn't, it didn't happen as much with medical marijuana laws because that was typically a state issued law. Um, although we did see people moving in some cases to live in a state where they could obtain medical marijuana. Uh, so that also happens. But yes, we definitely see cross border effects, just like we see. Uh, I, don't, I don't know who has the higher liquor taxes in your part of the world, but I live maybe 10 miles from the Georgia border and there's a liquor store right on the other side of the Georgia border because they have lower taxes. So people drive to Georgia <laughs> to buy their liquor, right? Like um, the same thing happens with all kinds of laws uh, um, with, with differential tax rates in tobacco and as well as with different levels of prohibition. We expect to see that people are seeking out those laws. Um, I don't know if that's a good or a bad thing. And it's a, I mean, it's information, right? It tells you something about uh, uh, what's happening with consumption, how much people are looking for those opportunities to purchase out of purchase substances legally. And, and, and I think that's interesting in and of itself, right? So if we're not seeing we're not seeing this huge increase in consumption, but we are seeing a huge increase in legal consumption. So given the opportunity, people have really switched from uh, buying in an illicit market to buying in a legal market because they would prefer to do that because it's safer, they know what they're buying, they're interacting with people that they feel more comfortable with because it's in this legal environment. Um, so I, I think there's a lot of benefits there too. Right. Well, and I like how it gets back to kind of the state experiments, uh, yeah. having different laws offers different information to people and they can reveal their preferences by um, moving to a different state or going across the border to Georgia to buy their liquor. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we have another question from a Hope Principles of Economics student, Jonah, uh, who asks about the employment consequences of backtracking on the war on drugs and the $47 billion a year. He asks, how would that affect jobs of those who work in that field? Then how might we find other positions for them given their specialization since there is now a lower demand, uh, lower demand for people enforcing those drug laws? Right, so, um, right. so certainly what we would expect to see is here we have a whole apparatus of police and legal courts and prison guards who are employed in enforcing um, our drug laws, what are they gonna do? <laughs> so, uh, and there's a couple possibilities. So one thing that we see in some locations is that it, it's not that the police just stop working, right? We, what we see instead is that police officers spend their time enforcing other laws, um, presumably laws that have victims and, and we might be more concerned about um, police. We, so we see greater clearances in, in, in other kinds of laws like robberies and assaults and um, police spending more time in that. So that doesn't necessarily, that's a shifting of their time, which 
could be more productive. I, I would argue is more productive um, because we're actually arresting criminals instead of people engaging in trucking and bartering. Um, the prison guards, it's going to a little bit depend. And I think, in fact, you're sort of you're getting at, or the question is getting at, you know, there are strong political forces against liberalizing drug laws because there are there's a whole there's a wide variety of people who are highly organized, including prison guards and police officers, um, that are not eager to see these laws changed because it would influence it would have it would reduce. Uh, a lot of what they spend their time on. So do I think we would see fewer police officers eventually? Yes. Do I think it would happen overnight? No, I don't. I, I think it would be slow and probably slow enough that many people would retire or find other jobs. Uh, and I think that might be a good thing, right? I don't think people these days are arguing for more police, right? And mostly <laughs> the argument is that we need less police. And here's a great way to sort of start that walking down that path uh, and having police focus their time and efforts on, on laws that are um, more harmful for communities. Um, do I think it would be a good thing if the US had fewer prisons, if they had fewer people to put in prison? Yes, I mean, we incarcerate huge numbers of people, but, I, but it's reasonable to ask, like, what are they gonna do? Um, you know, if federal law changed to the extent that, I, it actually, you know, it's a great question. I don't I actually don't even know if people have looked in states to see what has happened as they've relaxed their laws. That is a great question. What's happened to the number of police? I did look the other day and was surprised to find that, I don't remember if it was um, Colorado or Oregon, so they, their arrests for marijuana possession dropped and it dropped a lot. It dropped from like 6,000 to 2,000, but it didn't go to zero, which I thought was really weird, right? So like, um, um, if I can tie my thoughts together now. So, <laughs> so one, I think is an interesting research question to think about what's happened in those states to their employees. I think, I don't know that I've seen anyone do that. So I think it's a great question. Um, two, I, I would say, I would argue that what they are doing now is not a great use of their time and talent. That um, we would be much better off as a society if those men and women were engaged in more productive pursuits than enforcing the war on drugs. Um, so is it hard for people to make those transitions, particularly if they're midlife, mid-career? Yes, it is. And I think in some cases we've seen, uh, like when we've had huge trade liberalization laws, for example, there's usually grants that go along for retraining and things like that. Um, would I be amenable to that? Sure. Like, I think, great. Um, go, you know, we have huge needs for... Uh, all kinds of medical providers training to be nurses and PAs, like why not, right? Why not facilitate some of those career transitions? But I think that's an interesting political question, a great research question. I don't really know the answer to it all, but I hope that, I, I, I think we would all be better off if they found better uses of their time. So. Well, so maybe this is our, our last question uh, to bring us back to the, uh, kind of topic of morality. Mm. Do you have any additional suggestions for how those of us who do have moral qualms about drug usage, but also a skepticism about legislating morality, can have fruitful conversations with people who might find it more difficult to tease morality and lega legality apart? Um, you drew an important distinction between the two earlier, uh, but do you have any recommendations, even takeaways, for us tonight so that we might be most persuasive in the marketplace of ideas. So I think one, one word that Professor Estelle mentioned at the very beginning, which was one of my favorite words to focus on in these kind of liberty-friendly conversations is human flourishing. That, that idea of flourishing, I think is really powerful. Like it's not just that we want people to do whatever they want. Like I'm not a, a 
hedonist or libertine or whatever the right word is, right? Like, but I want people to pursue a life that is meaningful for them, that allows them to flourish. Um, and, and I think that all that we've learned about, not just about drug prohibition or the war on drugs, but also about political economy and economics, all of this suggests that the government's not very good at telling us how we individually can flourish as human beings. We need to discover that for ourselves in conversation with our friends and mentors. We need to try new things and we need to be in our life <laughs> present in it and thinking about it uh, and, and not scrolling through our social media feed or high on various substances or whatever, not escaping from our life, but living our life and finding good ways to um, direct our time, our talent and flourish as human beings. Is that a challenging conversation? Yeah, particularly for young people. Like I still don't, I mean, I'm probably twice your age, Anna Kate, I still don't know what I wanna do with my life, right? <laughs> like, um, so, and it's an ongoing conversation. What I wanted at 20 is not what I want now. And, uh, and I think there are hard conversations to have, but I, I think it's wonderful if you're having them with your friends. And I think it's fine if you don't even know what to say. I think having those conversations is great. Uh, indicating to your friends your, your love for them, your hope for their human flourishing are all wonderful conversations to have and to help them and you figure that out in your life. So um, go forth and converse. Uh, I love that you're doing it. It's wonderful. Well, with that, um, I will thank you, Dr. Dills, for your very thought-provoking lecture and for answering our questions and raising new ones that we can discuss with our peers. Um, this has been really, really great. So thank you so much. Thank you for the opportunity and the wonderful questions. It's really great. So thank you. And I want to thank you out there watching online uh, for joining us tonight. Please, again, email us at marketsandmorality at hope.edu if you have any questions or are interested in what we're up to. Um, and if we can ever be any service to you in answering or talking about any of these questions that were brought up tonight. Uh, we hope to see you on March 15 for our fun film screening and April 12 for another lecture on the intersection of markets and morality. Thank you so much and have a great night.